from the Honorable Favor Williams, who is the Minister of Education and Youth, and then finally, Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Before we go into that, though, we would like to announce some cabinet decisions and board appointments. I'll start off with the Noel Holmes Hospital Management Committee. Um, this board appointment is for the period effective February 12, 2024 to the 11th of February, 2027. And it will be chaired by Mr. Donovan Hamilton and have members Mr. Derek Storr, Mr. Loralda Spence, Mr. Devon Brown, Ms. Tamika Buckner, Mr. Hanif Moses, and Ms. Benita Carr. There are also ex officio members which comprise the Western Regional Health Authority as well as a representative from the employees of the Noel Holmes Hospital. We also had the appointment of the Pharmacy Council of Jamaica. Um, this was in the form of an addition of Mr. Mark Law as a member of the council with effect from the 12th of February this year to the 10th of December 2026 when the board is set to expire. Also, the Southern Regional Health Authority Board was renewed for three years. This is being chaired by Mr. Wayne Chen and includes Mr. Dave Powell, Ms. Lauren Green Mason, Mr. Marcus Greenwood, Mr. Stafford Horton, Mr. Albert Williams, Mr. Winston Mirage, Mr. Omar Miller, Dr. Lloyd Reynolds, and Mr. Michael Stern. And also, as typical with health boards, it has ex officio members from the region, as well as a representative of the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health and Wellness. The Board of Trustees for the Jamaica National Heritage Trust was also appointed from the for the period of the 12th of February, um, 2024, to the 5th of December, 2024, when the tenure of that board is expected to expire. And the additions to that board are Mr. Vivian Crawford as Deputy Chairman, as well as Dr. Shireen James Williamson and Mr. Andre Baugh. We now move to Cabinet approvals. Cabinet gave approval to the Housing Agency of Jamaica to divest three parcels of land, um, one beachfront and two contiguous lots located in Hopewell, Hanover, at a cost of $850 million to LCH Developments Limited. And the HAJ will be allowed to retain the full proceeds of the sale in relation to the property, as well as the other two parcels. Also, Jamaica was approved to host the 52nd Global Fund Board Meeting from the 19th to the 22nd of November, 2024. In relation to contracts, Cabinet approved the award of a contract for the supply of host of equipment to upgrade the new Tenix hyperconverged infrastructure at Eagle of Jamaica Limited to facilitate the hosting of a correctional management system for the Department of Correctional Services this contract was valued at 801,000 US dollars, which is inclusive of the general consumption tax. Um, and this was done to Info Exchange Limited. There was also the approval of a contract by the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority for the provision of a new instrument landing system with distance measuring equipment to be deployed at the Norman Manley International Airport. And this is in keeping with the endorsement of the Public Procurement Commission, which recommended to Cabinet that the award be in the amount of 1.3 million US dollars to Intel Can Techno Systems Limited. And finally, Cabinet approved the award of a contract for the supply and delivery of compressed natural gas fuel buses, that's 100, for the Jamaica Urban Transit Company. And this was endorsed by the Public Procurement Commission and the award was for 18,900,000 US dollars to Vans Motor, Vans rather, Motor Company Limited. And at this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Dana Morris Dixon, Senator, the Honorable Dr. Dana Morris Dixon. She will be addressing several matters related to her portfolio. 
She's Minister Without Portfolio with Responsibility for Digital Transformation here at the Office of the Prime Minister. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Tanisha Ingleton, who is the Managing Director of Heart Trust, Heart NSTA Trust, right? And also Dr. Warren Vernon, who is Project Lead at NILS. Also want to welcome members of the Heart Team who are here in support of Dr. Morris Dixon. You are welcome. Thank you very much, Minister Morgan, and good morning, everyone. Today, I'm really going to be speaking to two matters where we've gotten a lot of requests for information, and those two relate to NIDS and also to the CARE initiative, which was announced by the Prime Minister in his budget presentation. So I'll start with, with NIDS. And um, there's been a WhatsApp that's been circulating with a lot of misinformation and disinformation. And it is really very disconcerting to see WhatsApps like this. Um, it speaks to um, a host of falsities about NIDS and the program. And they have to be dispelled. And I will start by noting that NIDS and getting the national ID, the digital ID, is a voluntary exercise. The law is very clear that no one has to be, has to get this. It is on a voluntary basis. So the government will never say that you have to do it or if you don't do it there is a fine or there is any kind of threat of arrest. That is absolutely false. And so anyone who sees WhatsApp messages like this going around really need to delete them and also to note to the person who has sent it that this is false information. And we're seeing this more and more in, in, in our country and, and generally in the world too. We see these efforts at misinformation and disinformation. And it is very important that we counter it. And so I say this morning that there is absolutely no truth to what has been put in this WhatsApp that says that if you do not have your NIDS ID, you cannot access government services. Government services are the rights of every single Jamaican. And so there would never be any attempt to try to have persons be kept away from government services due to a new national ID. That is completely false again. And so um, it's important that we know the truth about NIDS. NIDS is an effort that has been in train for a long time, for decades. We have spoken about a national ID and the need for one that can be verified from the 1970s, and it may even predate that, but we do see the evidence of those discussions in Parliament about a national ID and the need for one. And so after all these years and all these discussions, we're finally at the moment where we have this national ID that is easily verifiable. And so one of the key things that we need to note in terms of the build out of NIDS is that it has been done with trust at the center of it. So everything that is done in relation to data sharing or verification that is done that is done with each individual citizen being absolutely aware of what has happened. And I give this example all the time. You know, for example, with a bank or, um, and you're trying to open an account, you will give the bank several pieces of information. In many instances, they do verify them. They verify through third parties. With your NIDS ID, they will also verify and they will call on the NIDS system and they will verify that this ID is an authentic national ID. But the difference that you will have with this system is that if someone verifies your identity or your identity information from your NIDS ID, you know. You will get a text message, you will get an email. So this is where we are bringing transparency to the entire process and where our people can feel that they have control over their information and they know how that information is being used. So the NIT system has been set up 
with a lot of those concerns, those concerns of trust built into its development. And so what I say this morning is again, it is voluntary and again, that it is built for our people to feel a sense of trust in the processes that we have. And um, in terms of persons being fined for not having needs, that will never happen. Because again, the law is very, very, very clear that this is a voluntary exercise. And of course, we think that there will be benefit from having this ID that has all of the information embedded in it and you can verify it and has all these security features attached to it. And over time, we expect that people will see that it is making their lives easier. But that is always on a voluntary basis as per the law. So that's my, my little spiel on NIDS, just reminding everyone that NIDS is voluntary, voluntary, voluntary. No one will be forced to have this ID. Um, the other one that we had uh, um, some questions about related to the care program that was announced by the Prime Minister, and that was one that has received quite a lot of excitement. We've seen um, many persons calling Heart and wanting to know more about this, how it's going to be executed, and the Heart team is here and they can give some more details um, in relation to the care program. But as the Prime Minister said, it is really a program that's been designed to deal with what we hear on the ground. This is a government that listens to our people. And when the Prime Minister was able to go into the communities and speak to young men, young women, who are not in training and who have been reluctant to go into training but are ripe for skills training, and we know that this could change their lives, they were saying a few things. They were saying that they couldn't afford to go where the heart training institutions were. And we know heart cannot be in every single community with every single program. And so you have programs in various areas. And that was a concern. How am I going to get there? And so the program was developed through listening to those voices. And those voices said, help us with transportation. And so as a part of the CARE initiative, the students who are the young trainees that will be taken on, they will get a transportation grant. In addition to that, there were many young people who said that, you know, um, the fees in heart have been eliminated, and that's great, but I also have to hustle. I have to hustle. My family needs food. I have to find a little work here or there. If I have to go to do skills training, I am going to not be able to earn that little money that my family needs. And it's for that reason that the element of the stipends was included also. And so what we're doing is listening to what our young people are saying and putting in place programs that address those needs. And that's what CARE is about. It's really a very caring initiative where we care about what our young people have said in terms of what's detracting them from taking up skills training. And we're putting in place mechanisms to mitigate against those concerns that they have. And so as you would have heard, um, there will be 30 students that will be, or young people that will be selected from all 63 constituencies, so 13 each, which will be a total of 1,890 persons that will go through this program. The details, um, we are going to go to cabinet with some of the details. The heart team has done a tremendous job in terms of fleshing out how it could work. Um, there are some very interesting programs that they've also layered onto it, so it's not just a program where you incentivize persons to go to training. And I should note that this is something that's been done in Latin America. It's, um, it's done quite routinely because it's understood that the things, the factors that are preventing people from getting skills training is not just about the elimination of tuition. It's also about other realities that they face. And for many of them, going to access skills training means that they cannot support their families in the ways that their families need to be supported. 
But we also understand that a lot of these young people are not really necessarily ready for skills training or work. And so there have to be other programs that are built into it. And so the HART team has been working to look at how they can embed much more in terms of entrepreneurship into the program. We know our young people want to work for themselves. They want their own business. And psychosocial support is really important. The counseling is very important. In many instances, our young people, for no fault of theirs, have not been in an environment where they saw people who went to work on a regular basis, went to work every day and did that grind or went through a skills training program. And there are other psychosocial issues from their communities that need to be addressed. And so we're not just taking these young people into our program and saying, go get skilled. You're going to go do plumbing or you're going to go do construction or even going to do software development. That's not what Hart is trying to do. What Hart will do is also try to build them up. That's what our administration is really committed to. How do we build up people? And so it's not just a cash for training program. It's also looking at the psychosocial elements that are really critical in terms of moving forward. Now, we will come with a lot more details on the program um, as we, we get the approvals in place and as we execute on it. Um, but those are some of the general highlights um, of the program. And I know there are two other ministers who have a lot to say, so I'm going to stop there Minister Morgan, and um, give the others a chance to go or take any questions if there are any questions. Minister? Thank you very much. Um, we will take questions before <laughs> you leave. Okay. Um, I would like to apologize to, to members of the public as we seem to be having a little challenge with our live stream, but we're working to get it back up. Mm -hmm. Members of the media are welcome to ask questions to Minister Dana Morris Dixon. They have any? Do we have any questions from members of the media? You, es you escaped today. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. There is oh, there is one. There is oh. one. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Simone Absalom Gale, and I'm from the Public Broadcasting Corporation of Jamaica, PBCJ. I was just wondering, any update on the number of persons who have signed up so far? I know there's a pilot program going. All right. For, for CARE, there isn't a pilot program yet. It was announced by the Prime Minister as a new initiative. Oh, NIDS. Okay, NIDS. All right. So with NIDS, there was a um, pilot that took place last year. Um, January last year, 300 persons volunteered to be a part of the pilot, and they tested the system, and that's the key thing. They tested the system so that tweaks could be made to it, and they did, and Dr. Vernon is here, and you can speak to it, but they even looked at how our sign-up desks were configured, especially for persons with disabilities. Was it configured properly? Um, how did someone sign? Should the signing thing be on the right or on the left? There was a lot of that kind of intelligence that was gained from it. As they, after that pilot, they tweaked many elements of the, the sign-up process, and then they went into further development of the program and ensured that the security protocols, because it needs to, the key thing is security and making sure those security pro, um, protocols were as robust as possible, and also starting the renovation of the post offices because the sign-up points will be post offices. So there are eight that are being worked on now. So in addition to CSO, there will be eight. But we're looking at 24 post offices in total that will be renovated due to this NIDS program as enrollment sites. And that's in train. Right. Uh, we, have, we have any more? Naomi? Uh, not for Minister Morris Dixon. We are back up on uh, the stream. Yes, thank you very much. We are back online. Thank you. Dr. Morris Dixon, thank always you. welcome to have you. Thank you. All right, take care. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now have a uh, Minister of Education and Youth, the Honorable Favor Williams, to make some very important announcement. I'm looking forward to hear about the Youth Awards. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Good morning, everyone. Allow me to begin by acknowledging my colleague ministers, the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith and the Honorable Robert Nesta Morgan as well, um, Senator the Honorable Dana Morris Dixon, and from the Heart Trust, Dr. Tanisha Ingleton and her team, and from the NIDS group, Dr. Warren uh, Vernon. Let me also acknowledge the team from the Ministry of Education and Youth, in particular, our Permanent Secretary, Dr. Kassan True, members from the media, Jamaicans here and in the diaspora. Happy Wednesday and a good morning to all. We have three items to speak about this morning. The, for the first one, we will speak to the um, ETOC, the Education Transformation Oversight Committee. They recently reported to the nation on the progress of education transformation. We continue to build on that momentum through the trend campaign, which is the ministry's effort to communicate boldly and assertively with all Jamaicans. As you know, there are many things competing for the attention of Jamaicans. You know, there's Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok, LinkedIn, radio, newspaper, TV, all kinds of events that are beckoning. And of course, everyone has the daily demands of their own lives amidst the various tasks we have to do for our families and just to keep bodies and souls together. Amidst all of these demands for the attention of Jamaicans, we want Jamaicans to understand what we are doing to transform education so that we can begin to see improved reading skills at all levels of the education system and so that we can begin to see more of our children liking and performing well in math, science, and other subject areas. Beyond the subjects, we want to inculcate in our students pro-social behaviors. And by that I mean those behaviors that benefit other people or society as a whole, such as helping, sharing, donating, cooperating, and volunteering. We want our children to be respectful to value education and skills training, to value cleanliness in their immediate environments and the wider Jamaica, to see virtue in work, cultivate honesty, empathy, to obey laws and rules and conform to societal accepted, to conform to socially accepted behaviors. This all leads into the education philosophy that we will seek to inculcate in Jamaicans. Following extensive consultations with key stakeholders, including students, student leaders, parents, members of the church community, teachers, principals, education officers, and other technocrats, and discussion at cabinet. All of this took a whole year for us to go through. This morning we are pleased to announce that the education philosophy for Jamaica has been finalized. It has been disseminated to the education system on schools bulletin 49-2024 this bulletin was sent to our principals on April 3rd, 2024. And the team at the Ministry of Education and Youth continues to sensitize the education system to the philosophy. Happening today in Montego Bay is yet another awareness building exercise at which the team will also remind principals of the education philosophy. It is also published on our website. And just so Jamaicans are aware, the school's bulletin is the ministry's official communication channel to our principals on whom we depend to further disseminate information that they receive in the school's bulletins to teachers and staff. We also are depending on our principals and teachers to bring the philosophy alive in the school communities 
via devotions, discussions, and other activities. This morning, a recommendation of the Jamaica Education Transformation Commission Report 2021, also known as the Orlando Patterson Report, is that we widely promote an education philosophy which sees learning as a collaborative interaction between teachers, students, and the curriculum, and pursue efforts to ensure widespread acceptance. Let me pause to invite Omari and Leanne from Mona High School. They will read the education philosophy this morning for us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Omari Johnson. And I'm Leanne Smith. As a former student of Mona High, the school of choice, I will now present the philosophy of education for Jamaica. Under God, the Jamaican educational philosophy embraces diverse learning capacities and styles, aiming to nurture each learner's full potential. We provide a comprehensive education, blending academics and vocational pursuits with value-based teachings and life skills. Our focus is on fostering community harmony, appreciating our cultural heritage, promoting inclusivity, environmental stewardship, and respect for all. Through this approach, we aim to cultivate learners' understanding of themselves, respect for humanity, and love for country as embodied in our national vision, anthem, and pledge. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I'll move on to item two. The second item speaks to the continued efforts by the team from the Ministry of Education and Youth, including our teachers. Uh, the commitment, expertise, and passion are undoubtedly on demonstration as we celebrate Math Week all week long this week. This year's theme, Adding Up the Excitement, Math Rocks, is both a well-needed affirmation and reminder of the subject's importance in our daily lives and in the direction we are moving as a country to meet the labor force demands. On Monday, the National Mathematics Team collaborated with the University of the West Indies Mathematics Department to host our first joint awards ceremony celebrating ex excellence in mathematics. I also extend congratulations to the teachers and note that these teachers would be responsible for 2,200 students from 101 primary and preparatory schools entering the qualifying rounds of the junior competition of the Jamaica Mathematics Olympiad and the approximately 480 students from 29 high schools who entered the senior competition. The final round of the junior competition saw 988 students sit in the exams, of which 62 were recognized for their achievements. For the senior competition, recognition was given to 50 top performers from grades seven to 11. We applaud all initiatives that aim at improving the math scores of our students. And we want to recognize the top three math teachers for the year, first, second, and the third places. All those teachers came from our primary schools. In first place, um, Ms. Kamika Ingram from Green Pond Primary School. Second place, Yannika Pitt, from Mount Nebo Primary School. And in third place, we have Anicia Walker, Savannah La Mar Inclusive Academy. Congratulations, we applaud you for your hard work in a subject area that many persons find difficult. And now turn into the final item, the Prime Minister's Youth Awards for Excellence. This Saturday, April 20th, we will celebrate and highlight the achievements 
or for youth at the upcoming Prime Minister's Youth Awards for Excellence. I want to acknowledge all the 50 nominees and all the young people who are doing all they can to drive change and make a difference. As you know, the Prime Minister's Youth Award for Excellence is part of the government's drive to nurture excellence at the national level. Under this initiative, outstanding youth are recognized for their remarkable achievements in various fields, including academics, agriculture, arts and culture, community development, entrepreneurship, environmental protection, journalism, national leadership, new media, science and technology, and in sports. There are requirements uh, for each category, and those are specific to their respective fields. The standard requirements for eligibility is that the nominees must meet the award criteria for the category in which they are nominated and be a Jamaican national or naturalized citizen for at least three years. They should be between the age of 15, they are between the age of 15 and 29 years, and an upstanding member of society. The Prime Minister's National Youth Awards for Excellence enables us to celebrate our young leaders as the role models, and we do this publicly during the award ceremony coming up. Our young leaders represent an example of what it means to be self-motivated, whilst working towards the greater good of adding to the high-functioning demographic of the country's human capital. Sustained youth participation and leadership are critical in assisting the Ministry of Education and Youth with the implementation of youth development initiatives. So please join me in magnifying the good things that are taking place in the education and youth spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Minister Williams. Um, before we go to Minister Johnson Smith, um, I'm wondering if any members of the media have any questions for um, Minister Williams. Do we? Uh, okay, we have one online, one here. Uh, Minister, since you are, I'm, I'm walking toward the person with a question from TVJ, but Minister, there's one online that is asking you to be very clear in terms of the contrast or comparison between the new education philosophy and what previously existed. Dr. Chu? Dr. Chu, I'm going to. I'm going to have Dr. Chu speak to that. Come over here, Dr. Chu. Because as I okay. mentioned, we spent a whole year. Yes. Um, Good morning, everyone. Dr. Chu, go ahead. So, um, the Ministry of Education is transforming, and as we transform, we have to reflect on how we view our learners, how we view the players in education. Where we're coming from, the system was built on constructivism, um, cognitive um, perspectives. We have B Robert um, um, Bandura guiding some of our philosophy. We have Pavlov guiding some of what we do in the classroom. Over the years, we have had to reflect what do these theorists say about learning? And what do we believe as a country? And what do we want for our people? And so we went back as a ministry because predominantly we supported the behaviorist perspective. We look at things that are good and we cherish them and we laud them and we put good things out there and we expect that students will comply. And that's how we have been pouring in our teachers and pouring in our students. That's how we have been prepared as teachers in our colleges. Predominantly, what do we bring to the process? In transformation, we're talking about predominantly the constructivist perspective. What do we believe about our learners? What do they bring to the process? As a country, as a ministry, we have to give recognition to the agency in our learners. They come to us with talents. They come to us with abilities. How do we hone that? How do we meet them where they are? That's what's different. What's different, you will also see that we have made God the center of what we do. Jamaica is a Christian country. 
And that philosophy is important for how we are, how we treat each other. We have made the vision of this country a significant component of the philosophy. We have made the pledge that we recite every single day, and of course our anthem, an important part of that philosophy. We have been listening to the cries of Jamaica. We have been talking about how our students are, the behavior of our students. Well, we have looked at how we can exist in harmony as a community in education. And so it includes what the parents will do. It includes what our teachers will do. It includes what we believe about our teachers. Are they responding? Are they just giving and pouring in? Are they the guides on the side? Or are they the sage on the stage? That's the difference. So our teachers are being positioned to be the guides on the side. Content is available. We don't lock content. In the past, we were trained as teachers to hone and deposit. Now, content is everywhere. How do we get our learners to access that content? How do we lift them to the level of analysis and critical thinking? How do we say, look at this content in the public space, what has been said about needs? How do we critically analyze that for the facts? That's what the philosophy will do. So that's different. It's about how we see our learners. It's about how we see our teachers. It's about how we position our players in education for the collective good of this country. Thank you. Thank you for that comprehensive response, Dr. Troop. So we're putting our students at the center, and of course, we're also ensuring that we build on critical thinking skills. Very well done. All right, now we have a question from TVJ. Hi, good morning. I'm Jamela Maitland. I'm a reporter at TVJ News. All right, my question is for the Minister of Education. Minister, how many private facilities like the one in Treasure Beach, that's Atlantis Leadership Academy, that seemingly caters to predominantly U.S. children is the ministry aware of in Jamaica? And I have one more. In light of the allegations there, has there been any revision to how the ministry engages these private institutions, whether new or existing? Okay, so in addition to the, the one that we uh, became aware of in Treasure Beach, we're also aware of another one in another part of Jamaica that we are investigating. I wish not to say exactly where it is currently. Um, of course, as you know, any educational institution offering services to our children must be registered with the Ministry of Education and Youth. We have a whole department set up for that. Um, this particular institution in Treasure Beach was not registered with the Ministry of Education and Youth. They did make inquiries at some point in time some years ago. Um, but we've searched our records and they were not registered. So they're operating in a space um, that is outside of the regulatory framework. They came to our attention and we acted immediately. And as you know, as reported in the press, an investigation is happening right now. The children who were there were uh, taken by the CPFSA. Uh, some, some of them have already been returned to their parents or other institutions in the US. And we continue to monitor and provide for the ones that are still here as they go through the process. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, just a follow up to that question, Minister. As it relates to the new, the other um, institution, May I ask if that one was also registered as well? That one is registered. Okay. Just two more questions. Um, as it relates to teacher retention right now, I want to ask what's the status for guidance counselors? I know there was one institution in St. Catherine, I think it was Independence Primary, that was crying out for another guidance counselor, or at least two more. Uh, may I ask? If you could just provide a status on that and also shadows for schools with behavioral issues. Right, so an additional guidance counselor was provided for Independence Primary School. With regards to shadows, which are those individuals who um, are with a, a special needs student in our schools, it could be 
uh, an activity that requires them to be with the child to and from school. It could be an activity in classroom where uh, somebody is required to read to the child so that they can comprehend and give questions and so on. There are a range of activities provided by what we call shadows. We have at least 400 of them in the system currently um, that are paid for by the Ministry of Education and Youth. And um, I want to say when we look at our requests for shadows still, we have over 300 requests still for shadows. So there is still a gap that we need to fill. It, uh, it is an important um, offering of the education system for children with special needs. Uh, Minister, if you could stay there, just two more questions online that I'm seeing. One person is asking, uh, it, it, with the new school philosophy, is there a more broader comprehensive look at the school plant as opposed to uh, looking at the curriculum, uh, the school plant meaning that is there uh, a, a, a move to address the physical plant, the layout of classrooms, etc. Right, so coming out of the Orlando Patterson led report, um, one of the big pillars of transformation is infrastructure and technology. And yes, we have to not only repair the existing plant, ensuring that those critical repairs are done, but we have to look differently at how our schools are configured, um, what is the material that we used to build them, because you know, um, just this morning, listening to the news, I'm learning that the temperatures are going to be even hotter than we experienced last year. So there's a lot to be done in our schools with regards to the physical infrastructure that we have to take on. We've started already in our thinking in terms of describing um, just the, the new format for schools that they have to incorporate different things into them as we go forward. Um, I just want to say, given the size of the education sector, because when you look, we have 1,009 primary and secondary schools across Jamaica. I don't think Jamaicans realize the quantum of what we're dealing with. It's going to take us some time to get all those schools retrofitted or rebuilt in order to incorporate the new environment in which we're operating going forward. Thank you, Minister. And the person did say that they were alluding to the heat in particular. Uh, they just had a follow-up, and I'll ask the follow-up. And, and the other question, that is the final question I'm seeing. Uh, so is there anything that's going to be done about how we deal with students battling the heat, uh, especially since it started getting so hot and school goes up until the end of June, first week in July? Is there any special measure? that the government will be putting in to deal with that. And the final question that I saw that came in before that follow-up was just an update that they wanted on the uh, STEM schools that's being built by the government. All right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Dr. Troop to help me on both those questions. Okay, so with respect to the plans for the heat, so currently, the technical team is building out what we call, or updating what we call our water resiliency plan. So we know there is a water challenge, and coming out of COVID, we have some learning opportunities there and that we are building on. So we have a network of what's happening in our schools, which are the schools getting pipe water, tanks, needing tanks, needing upgrades, repairs. We have a cadre of private providers who will deliver water to our schools if it is that there's a challenge in our schools. We measure the storage capacity of the storage facilities in our schools and how long they will be able to last. And so we put a rhythm in place to respond to the needs of our school with respect to water. As we look at the physical infrastructure, as Minister said, this will be an ongoing effort. And if you look at the transformation report, predominantly um, the, the cost that was estimated for the eight years program 
um, two thirds of that has to do with the infrastructure improvement in our school. So we have to look at how we retrofit the spaces. But interestingly, as we are going through the conversations with our students, we actually had a series of interviews with our students and we talk about what do you want for your learning space and we talk to the principals about what do you want for your learning space. Our principals will interestingly say we need classroom, we need to build big structures. And our students repeatedly say to us, we want to be outside. We want to be free, we want to play, we want to move. So some of the things that we have built in as we are building out and, and upgrading our school is to talk about the, the breaks, small breaks, small stretches, being outside, you know, giving the children breathing time. We have water days in our schools now, we have fruit days in our schools. And as we are doing those small things, we are looking at how we are retrofitting our new buildings to be climate smart. That's a new technology going into our new schools. We have consultants now working with us to look at the design of these, these new schools, and it won't be limited to the new schools. What we are looking at, when we get this design that is climate friendly, that will be the guide to use for the upgrade of our existing schools. So we're not leaving them behind. So the new learning will be used to guide how we improve our current infrastructure. But we do small steps now. So we're asking our teachers to get the students out, give them their breaks, open the window, let the children move. They have been asking for this. And it's not going to be overnight, an overnight fix to retrofit. It's a, it's a phase process. This year, in the new budget, we have $2 billion committed to capital infrastructure, and we are going to move expeditiously. We didn't spend all we got last year, but the good part of that is that those schools are shovel ready, and so we are moving quickly to get those in place. We did very well at the maintenance program last year. We invested $210 million right across the seven regions, and I can proudly report that our regional building officers did exceptionally well this year. All the, the schools that were down to be retrofitted, upgraded, maintained, they were all supported on the ground. So we are making small steps, but bigger plans are coming as we get climate friendly, given the new demands. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much to Minister Williams and her very able Permanent Secretary, Dr. Kassan Troop. Also want to thank members of the Ministry of Education and Youth for attending um, this post-Cabinet press briefing. Uh, we will now have a presentation from Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith. And um, with her here this morning is Mrs. Ariel Bowen, who is Acting Under Secretary for Diaspora and Counselor for the Diaspora and Counselor Department, as well as Mr. Lloyd Wilkes, who is a Director of Counselor Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Minister, welcome. Thank you very much, Minister, and I greet my colleague ministers, uh, representatives of ministry, other ministries, departments, and agencies, members of the media, and everyone who is joining us online. Good morning to you. Uh, I am hoping to, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I will try, but we're as hoping to deal with three matters today. One, to update the public on our ongoing preparations for the 10th uh, Biennial Diaspora Conference to be held in June 16 to 19 uh, in Montego Bay uh, of this year. Uh, the an update on the formation of Haiti's Transitional Presidential Council, uh, which I spoke on the last time I was here, and uh, some questions had been raised about the, uh, the implementation of full free movement in CARICOM. The original date had been set for March 31. I know persons were asking, well, what's happening with that? I was hoping to say a few words on that as well. Um, thank you for my team members who are here with me as well. And I will just launch into the Biennial Jamaica Diaspora Conference. Again, you would recall that the conference theme for this year is United on the 
uh, United rather for Jamaica's transformation, fostering peace, productivity, and youth empowerment. And we're very pleased that our conference chairperson is Courtney Campbell, the CEO of Victoria Mutual, one of our three legacy partners. And the person who is in charge of preparation of the conference program is a former member of the uh, Umbrella UK diaspora organization, JD UK, and a former member of the GJDC, the Global Jamaica Diaspora Council uh, for the UK, now a returning resident, Dr. Kevin Brown, who is the newly appointed pre uh, president of UTEC. So we are very proud of the amazing partnerships that we have in place and that have been fostered as part of our diaspora engagement, which has crossed administrations for 20 years in its formal format. The goal of the conference, of course, is to facilitate broader idea exchange, leveraging diaspora insights for actionable solutions, and forging strategic partnerships beneficial to both Jamaica and our diaspora. And uh, the conference also serves as a critical tool to inform local policies and development strategies through collaborative solutions, uh, which culminate in concrete actions and, and post-conference action plans for implementation. So what this means is through our conferences, which are held every two years, more Jamaicans with more ideas, more talents, and more resources come to the table for us to work together, and this year under the theme United for Jamaica's Transformation, with a focus on the three pillars also named. So we are anticipating welcoming a good group of persons from far and wide across the diaspora, because now we're engaging with our members in continental Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, and as far away as Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, as well as our traditional families from the USA, Canada, and the UK. Uh, the global and regional launches are now underway. Our global launch took place on the 4th. We had a record 3,000 persons joining us online, so you must know the ex excitement level is high, and there was standing room only in our Kingston Hall down at the ministry. Minister Terrellong is now also overseas participating in our virtual satellite launches. Uh, so he launched in the UK on the 15th, uh, continental Europe on the 16th, and he is heading to Miami tomorrow for the Florida launch. Uh, and I have to say, again, the launches have had high turnout, and we note in particular the positive turnout for the continental Europe uh, exercise because that is one of our newer diaspora locations so the networks are really very young and when people turn out you know it's a positive sign that people are excited so I'm delighted to share that preparations are progressing very smoothly 80% of our booths are booked out and we have our GK group, JN group, VM group, National Bakery, Digicel, Island Car Rental, Jamaica Tourist Board, Blue Maho Capital, Pinnacle Developments, NHT, JMMB, Stock Exchange, Student Loan, the Convention Center, which is giving us a very tiny discount, Ibero Star Hotel, Ocean 10 Hotels, and we are endorsed by the Jamaica Umbrella Group of Churches. So. Heart is going to say, oh, that's wonderful, Heart, welcome. And I'll use the opportunity to say that you can come to our website, mfaftja.gov.jm. There is a banner that, you, that has a QR code, uh, and there's also a link so you can enter the registration portal, and you can also find out more information on the prospectors. How can you participate? How can you get a booth if you are able to get in quickly enough? Um, the, the website itself is diasporaconferenceja.eventbrite.com, but of course the easier way is at the ministry website because that's a Google and a click away. Um, so, uh, but I would like to, to just invite Mrs. Bowen to share uh, a bit more about the preparations and, and the content of the conference, to share a little bit more with you on that side of our activities. Please, Mrs. Bowen. Thank you, Minister, and good morning, everyone. Um, so, Minister, I, I'm feeling the excitement that you are you know, bringing across to the audience here this morning. And I just want to say, in terms of the program that is being planned, things are going well. We started quite a few months back, and this has involved a very consultative process. So, um, of course, the Global Jamaica Diaspora Councils, both the Senior Council and the Youth Council, who are basically in the communities overseas, who are able to share with us what the diaspora is asking for. They've been a critical part 
of the initial discussions. <clears throat> and um, we also have various stakeholders as well. We have been taking a very um, integrated approach to um, diaspora engagement. And so many of you here today are part of that um, stakeholder interest that we have had. So we've had ministry, the, the MDAs, ministries, departments, agencies, our legacy partners who are also intelligence gatherers in the diaspora. So the program that we have been putting together has a whole range of different um, issues that we want to um, address. Uh, among them, um, let me just name a few of them. There's a very strong investment um, focus because we want to encourage diasporans who over the years have been asking about what's in it for me. So there are opportunities to come to Jamaica and to find out where the um, investment opportunities are and for them to take advantage of that. Health, education, philanthropy have been long-standing um, agenda items and we I don't know when we will ever stop having those because those are uh, of critical importance for the diaspora. National security. Um, we know the diaspora want to share ideas about solutions for our security issues, and so we have that on the agenda. We also want to, because of the focus on the diaspora, we want to also be able to discuss some of the challenges that the diaspora is having um, in their communities. If it's immigration, for example, maybe you're a new immigrant and you're facing challenges, how can we in Jamaica help you to overcome those challenges, as well as um, persons in the diaspora who may have experiences and want to share them as well. So uh, we also have the issue of constitutional reform. We know they have a lot of interest in finding out what that is all about. Um, it's a broader issue, which of course will also address the matter of Jamaica moving away uh, towards a republic. So those will be addressed. Youth empowerment, as the uh, theme suggests, is a, is a big issue as well, and so that will be a part of the discussion. And you know, Minister mentioned about having a former member of the diaspora, Dr. Kevin Brown, who is the president of UTEC, who is now here, having returned. And he is helping us to put together that program. Um, they, there will also be government at your service. And again, you heard about Hart and others who will be having booths set up. Uh, we, what we want to do is to be able to provide fast track services to the diaspora. And so we're looking at um, PICA, RGD, the company's office, revenue. It's not revenue anymore. It's, it's, um, it has another nice fancy name. TAJ, thank you. <laughs> So they're going to be there as well. If persons need to have their eyes uh, um, renewed, they will be able to do that. The marketplace, as has been mentioned, is going to be a very buzzing area where persons can come and explore some of the other services being offered, not only by government, but also by the private sector and, and other, other sectors. Um, the GG's Awards. We know that the diaspora is always appreciative when you recognize them, and there are so many persons in the diaspora who we need to recognize for the sterling services that they have been offering. So um, the Governor General will have his, his usual um, award ceremony, and we are also looking at other opportunities as well. We don't want to give away everything because we, we want to keep some of the, the surprises that we are going to be unfolding at the conference. Um, just to mention to Minister the matter of registration, we have started, we have opened the registration portal and Minister mentioned um, the, the, the access to that information. Uh, when a persons enter that, there will be the opportunity to register, uh, to make a payment for the fee. We have not increased the fees over the last three years because we want to make it as attractive as possible to persons coming in. Um, so there is a QR code that will take you directly there and it will provide the names of the hotels that we have negotiated special prices uh, to make it enticing for the diaspora um, to, to take advantage of. Um, Minister, is that enough? Sounds good, sounds good. I, I will sum it up to say that it has always been big, but this year it's gonna be bigger. And it's always been great, but this year it will be greater. So in the marketplace, I mean, you find absolutely everything there. I've found the greatest artisans find a nice crochet beach cover up because there's a lady who comes with, the SDC has brought artisans in who have amazing skills and their products have been available. I hope we're having them again this year. But 
I mean, the point is the marketplace is open to everyone. So you can come and find what you're looking for, or you can come and sell what you want to sell. Uh, lots of opportunities, and we're really encouraging you. Uh, diasporaconferenceja.eventbrite.com or mfaftja.gov.jm. Find the QR code, go in, and you will find all the information that you need. Join us. You will not regret it. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Bowen. Very much appreciate it. And um, for those diasporans who are listening, there has never been a better time to join us, to mingle, to connect, to network, to come and look at all of the issues, peace, productivity, and youth empowerment. We have a lot of exciting panels, which some of you will be participating, but we know that it will be entirely representative and will ensure that the discussions play sufficient um, volume of time on your perspectives and your questions. So we want you to very much come and share in it with us. On the matter of um, Haiti's transitional presidential council, uh, you'll recall that the landmark outcome of the meeting that was held in Kingston on March 11th uh, with international partners and Haitian stakeholders, um, hosted by Jamaica and chaired by Guyana, uh, that the landmark outcome was the uh, document which uh, set out the agreement to establish a transitional presidential council comprised of seven voting members and two non-voting members and the agreement that on the establishment of the council and their naming of a prime minister that prime minister Henri and his council of ministers would resign um, paving the way for a new political process towards uh, new free, fair, and democratic elections. Um, I just wanted to update that that process made significant progress yesterday when the official decree naming the members was published in Le Moniteur in um, Haiti as required by their legal procedures. Uh, you might recall that the media was picking up that there were some queries when, uh, when the decree was published on the 8th but it did not name the members of the Transitional Council. Uh, the council members have now been named in yesterday's decree, uh, which we believe will uh, set a new path, or rather a new energy behind uh, the process which is underway. Uh, there are still some issues that are being sorted out uh, in terms of the, the content of the decree. Uh, but it has included the criteria that had been agreed in the, in, sorry, in the outcome declaration of March 11th and uh, does set the way for the next procedural steps on the path back to democracy. We will share that the political accord, a political accord rather, has been developed by the Transitional Council as well, which builds out their areas of responsibility and sets a framework for how they will function. So that um, is, uh, a, it has built a lot of confidence in the sense that there is clarity around how it is they plan to vote internally and operate the areas of focus including, of course, the establishment of the Provisional Electoral Council and a National Security Council that will manage arrangements in respect of the multinational security support mission, which has been authorized by the U.S. Uh, the, by the U.N., pardon me. The, um, the uh, partners continue to meet. Uh, the U.S., of course, has been the primary uh, proponent of funding for the MSS, but we continue to encourage all uh, members of the international community to provide support, even as they are providing support to other conflicts across the world. And we also um, continue to thank Kenya for their willingness to lead the initiative. And you would have picked up in the media as well, President Ruto and his government have welcomed the, exist the, the um, naming of the Transitional Council and are looking forward to engaging to help as Jamaica and CARICOM is committed to in the, as in the support of the HNP. So again, I remind, this is not an intervention. It is not a military intervention. It is not a takeover. It is a provision of necessary and practical support to a national police force that is outgunned and outmanned in the face of criminal gangs. So uh, again, uh, I know sometimes there's very emotional language used around the MSS, but it is not an intervention. It is a support mission, and it is intended to ensure that the lack of numbers, that there's, um, there are more numbers on the ground 
and that we compensate for some of the other deficiencies even as we train. And I can also just confirm that the training here is going well. Uh, we have 59 members of the Royal Bahamian Defense Force, 50 members of the Bah Belizean Defense Force here training at JDF uh, with uh, support and, uh, and, uh, and engagement by the Canadian, members of the Canadian Defense Force, who again are all here in partnership looking at how we can work towards restoring peace and stability in Haiti to set the stage for free and fair elections. Uh, on the matter of full free moment, movement in CARICOM, we will note, as has been, um, you know, been recognized in the public domain, that a decision of heads uh, last year in July 2023 had sought to move towards uh, full free movement by March 31st of this year. Um, I had signaled that it had always been Jamaica's assessment that there was a significant amount of technical work that would have to be done in order to achieve this goal. Um, so while I refer, sorry, reaffirm Jamaica's commitment to the principle of full free movement, we have always said this is the best way for all CARICOM nationals to experience and believe in the region, uh, the fact is that there's still a lot of work to do. And that has been recognized. There is an intergovernmental task force. Jamaica is a part of that. We're working through matters like the definitions of health care at the emergency level and at the primary level, uh, which means different things in different countries and has implications for not only capacity but for cost. Uh, so countries small and large are looking at the implications and how there can be some basic standards. Uh, similarly for education, we've been working with education on this as well uh, because access to primary and secondary would be a part of what is considered. And of course, Ministry of Labor and Social Security and Ministry of Finance we engage with very closely because of course there would be the right to work. So there will be a transitional period, um, but work does continue towards the next a uh, full regular meeting of heads which will be in Grenada in July of this year where uh, we will undoubtedly have a significant update if we don't have one before then but the IGTF continues to work and Jamaica continues to work as well. Um, I would, yes, so let me maybe stop at that point and then allow anything, any other questions to be asked. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, um, Minister Johnson Smith. Um, we will now open the floor. I think we're a bit over time, but we can take some questions um, from members of the media All right. in relation. Um, Naomi? Yes, we'll do just that. Let's go to the PBCJ. Uh, Minister, I'm sorry, there was also a question for uh, Minister William. Williams. An another uh, well, a follow-up question from one of the media entities. We'll do that as well. Um, Good morning, everyone. I'm Simone Absalom Gale from PBCJ television station. In regards to free movement within the, the region, I was wondering if uh, discussions are being had with the telecommunication entities and banking, because that seemed to be an issue with persons who are working, who are, say, um, customers of certain banks. They're not able to access funds as freely, mm -hmm. and say, persons who are customers of Flow or Digicel, um, is there some kind of communication where that is concerned where persons can retain their numbers or s stuff like that? No, those issues are absolutely not a part of the full free movement discussion. <laughs> those are parts of separate discussions okay. about how it is that um, we create more seamless connectivity in the region if there in fact are opportunities for there to be single rate determination instead of roaming. Those discussions have actually been underway for a while, but they have not been. You, I, every now and again, you see a ray of hope, and you hear about a Rome like your at home program or a, a package. Uh, but we have not been able to move to a single space consideration for roaming with telecoms companies. And um, because each country has its own numbering system, and they themselves um, are not integrated. There are, there are sort of wider considerations that would have to be made. Uh, but, so it's not a part of free movement, but it is a part of the integration discussions that are taking place. And on banking, one of the things that we have been working on for quite some time is how we can integrate, not only in terms of incorporation, but in terms of financial services. 
and capital services. Movement of people, movement of capital, they fall under different heads, but they are things that we, we had actually thought we would have made more progress on the movement of capital. You know, we have in respect of cross-listing on the stock exchange, etc. That came out of those same discussions, but there's still more work to be done, admittedly. Yeah. Right. Remember that there are some countries who still have foreign exchange restrictions, and those of us who don't. So there's, there's a lot of difficulty. Um, let me not say difficulty, but there are a lot of um, technical issues that have to be worked through to, to create what you would, the, the optimal levels of, of integration. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Minister. Really appreciate it. Our next question. Morning, Minister Jamila again from TVJ. Um, is the ministry aware of any Jamaicans in Haitian police custody? Mm -hmm. And can you say how many? Yeah, we have no official reports of any. We have had uh, reports that have been made to us uh, by two families earlier this year, and we have made inquiries based on their reports, made inquiries both of the honorary consul before he was evacuated, and then and through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, and they have not been able to verify any such information. So we know that there are, uh, that the families have said that they have been told by people who went to Haiti and came back to their communities that those people are there, but we are unable to confirm any such information at all. So we, we have continued to make inquiries as best as possible. And I, I would like to think that as um, institutional strength returns, uh, to Haiti that we will have better information available to us, but we have not given up, but I, but I cannot say that we have confirmed at all. I, I think there, um, there's a wider uh, inquiry that's also being made to see if they may be elsewhere, and um, that we'll update on in due course as well. Just to follow up, Minister, to what extent when Jamaicans are in custody elsewhere, does it trigger any systems here? Is it that the police there would speak to us or we would ask? They should um, report to, through their, their Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They should report either to the consulate who would report to headquarters to us here. That is how it should work. I ask because in September last year, there was a police report that said 12 Jamaicans are in Haitian custody. Mm -hmm. So I wondered whether or not those 12 Jamaicans have been released, or is the ministry aware of I don't those 12 that, Jamaicans? I don't have that report, but we can make inquiries. We can make further inquiries. If you can share it with us. I know when an inquiry was made recently, I asked if, they could sh if the media house could share the information so we could ask, because if we don't have it, we can't, we can't make inquiries. And things are difficult there from an informational perspective. And I have a follow-up. Um, can the ministry just provide an update as it relates to the children who came here from Haiti? Um, if you could also include any form of schooling, any social behaviors, anything like that. Oh, the disabled, the, or disabled persons who are here. I don't have an immediate update, save to know that my understanding is that Mustard Seed Communities is taking very good care of them. Uh, the conditions that had been established on their entry did, ensure, did request that they ensure that all uh, obligations in respect of what is normally required for care and custody of children uh, would be undertaken. You know that mustard seed, even before they received uh, these Haitian uh, persons with disabilities, uh, because I understand there are a couple adults, which is why I don't use the term children, but they are unable to care for themselves. Um, and they have always provided whatever is possible. Uh, the, the individuals, so far as I understand, they are severely disabled, so they are not necessarily able to participate in the education system. And um, the issue for them is more about um, physical care and uh, mental well-being. So I, I know that the mustard seed communities has made a call for you know, any persons who wish to support, to provide you know, food, but you know, uh, like ensure uh, easily digestible items, et cetera, because again, we're speaking about persons who are severely disabled and have um, therefore require very specialized care and um, dietary uh, support. 
Thank you, Minister. I know it's 10.15. I just want to, uh, I had actually omitted, the uh, journalist had sent this through as well. Uh, for the CEO in uh, Ministry of Education, uh, one, I, I believe there was not a response to the update on the STEM schools being built by, by the government, uh, so they'd like that. But also, uh, the question is, can the CEO uh, respond to uh, give us an update on the Stairtown Academy disciplinary hearing, which will take place today? So I'll respond to the STEM school question. Um, as you are aware, the Prime Minister some time ago announced uh, that we would have uh, six STEM schools and one performing arts school. Two of the STEM schools would be in each county. Um, we have started by identifying lands um, in two of the counties and we've actually for the one in St. Catherine, uh, we've actually made payment for the land and we're going through that process of uh, titling and so on. Um, and other activities are underway in terms of um, design work. With regards to the other area that has been identified in St. Anne, um, we are in the early stages of speaking with the owners of those lands and getting the necessary um, approvals for them. But other work is going on in terms of uh, building out an implementation team because for that one, we're working with the World Bank um, to, uh, in terms of the provision of financing and, and some technical expertise as well. With regards to Steertown Academy, I'll ask the PS. Okay, with respect to Steertown Academy, um, I know I've seen articles in the media. We're aware that we had some breaches concerning our external exams. The school, in addition to external partners, specifically the Overseas Examination Commission, entered into a series of investigations, interviews, and a report was made to the board concerning observed breaches. And so it is the responsibility of the board to conduct its hearing and to provide the outcome of that. At this point in time, the ministry is not aware of the outcome of that proceedings. We operate from devolved authority, and so it is the power invested in the board of management to manage that activity, after which, once the the decision has been taken and communicated. The board will write to the ministry through the structure for us to be informed. And of course, there are consequential proceedings depending on what the outcomes are that will take place from there. But at this point in time, we give way to the board to do its work. Thank you so much, PS Dr. Cassand Troop and Minister. Thank you so much. Uh, there are no further questions I'm seeing either online or on the floor at this time, Minister. Thank you very much, Naomi, and thank you to Dr. Dana Morris Dixon and her team from the Ministry, from the, well, the Office of the Prime Minister, Digital Transformation Era, um, Dr. Ingleton, um, Dr. Vernon, and your team. Thank you very much. Also, thanks to Minister Williams, her permanent secretary, Dr. Kassan Troop, and her team for being here with us, as well as Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith and her team from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Also, members of the media, um, members of the journalist fraternity, and you, the most important variable in this equation, members of the public for listening in, joining in, and participating. Until next time, 9 a.m. sharp, where we'll have another post-Cabinet press briefing, I wish for you a safe and productive day.